to Wednesday night at Calvary Chapel, Lehigh Valley, our Convergence of Prophecy, and our it's Wednesday night prophecy, and we're going to start it off with Isaiah. Um, we're going to start in chapter 15 and see how far we can go through. Um, I should tell you that, ver that chapters 15 and 16 is about Moab, and you guys understand or know where Moab came from. Moab was a result of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughter. If you remember the story, when God sent the angels to warn Lot and his family that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot and his family left, and the angels said, we can't, we can't do anything until you guys are safely out of this city. And so as they're leaving, Lot leaves with his wife and his two daughters, and the wife turns back, remember, and she turns into a cow lick, and a pillar of salt in the middle of the desert. And so Lot and his two daughters retreat to a cave, and that's where they are. Now, for some reason, his two daughters think this is the end of the world. We're the only people left in the world. There's no one else left. So we have to reestablish or repopulate the world. So they come up with this plan to get their father drunk, and they, the older one goes first, and she lies with her father. She gets pregnant. She gives birth to Moab, her son. She names him Moab, which is the father of the Moabites. The younger daughter does the same thing. She gets pregnant. She gives birth to a son. They name him Ammon, and he is the father of the Ammonites, both of which became a thorn in the side of Israel. So that's where Moab comes from. And as I said, these first two chapters we're going to cover um, are concerning the destruction of Moab. So chapter 15 of Isaiah, beginning in verse 1. An oracle concerning Moab. Because Ar of Moab is laid waste in a night, Moab is undone. Because Ker of Moab is laid waste in a night, Moab is undone. And that means they're all killed. They're all killed. He's gone up to the temple and to Debon, to the high places to weep. Over Nebo, over Mediba, Moab wails. On every head is baldness, every beard is shorn. In the streets they are, wear sackcloth, on the housetops and in the squares everyone wails and melts in tears. Heshbam and Elia cry out. Their voice is heard as far as Jehaz. Therefore, an armed men of Moab cry aloud. His soul trembles. Now, God doesn't tell us, Isaiah doesn't tell us, who the enemy is that's attacking Moab. Uh, most scholars believe this is Assyria, who was the world's superpower at that time. But an enemy, if it's Assyria or not, comes against Moab, which, by the way, is in current day Jordan. Moab is Jordan today. And they go up to the high places to weep. And what that means is where they have their idols. This is, this is where they're going to their temple to, to pray to their idols, to, to fall on their face before their idols for protection. But no protection comes. On every head is baldness. Every beard is shorn, meaning that against this once proud nation of Moab, disgrace and humiliation comes. There's lamentation and mourning in the streets, there's weeping, there's crying, there's wailing, there's tears in Moab because of the destruction. There's great stress as they're watching city after city after city be destroyed. Look at verse 5. My heart cries out for Moab. Now this is Isaiah talking. Her fugitives flee to Zoar and Eglis Shalaliah for the for at the ascent of Laoth they are weeping. On the road to Hamanim they rise a city of destruction. Isaiah's heart cries out for Moab. He's seeing this destruction. Now he's not seeing it, witnessing as it happens. He has a vision of it happening. And he sees all the death and all the destruction. And his heart cries out. His heart is broken because Isaiah has the heart of God. We know from scripture that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked that he desires that everyone comes to salvation, that everyone um, is in heaven with him. And so he has the same heart that God has. He's weeping. He's, 
he's his heart is broken over what's happening in Moab. And notice that they fled to Zoar, which, by the way, is the very same city that Lot and his two daughters fled to when they when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. The waters of Nimrim are in desolation. The grass is withered. The vegetation fails. The greenery is no more. Therefore, the abundance they have gained and what they have laid up, they carry away over the brook of the willows. And so what, what, he, what he's explaining here is that all the streams, all the waterways in Moab are stopped up. They're dammed up by the enemy, meaning there no water is getting to the fields for irrigation. So the crops are dying. The, field is, the fields are dying. All the vegetation is dying. And that was a common practice among enemies. They would stop up or, or even put salt over all the crops so that those fields were ruined for years. Or they'd stop the water so they would not only... It was just this complete destruction. Not only would they kill the people of the town, but they'd ruin it for years to come. And so here we're seeing now refugees are starting to flee. They're grabbing anything they can out of their homes, and they're running away. This once great, proud nation is desolate. It's being destroyed. For a cry has gone around the land of Moab. Her wailing reaches Eglim. Her, willing, her wailing rather reaches Berlim, for the waters of Debon are full of blood, for I bring upon Debon even more, a lion for those of Moab who escape for the remnant of the land. The rivers that once ran through Moab are no longer rivers of life. They're now rivers of death. They're, they're flowing with blood because of the immense slaughter, because there's so much death in this town. Now, it's interesting, Isaiah says that there's a lion for those of Moab who escape, and some believe that even if you escaped the city, even if you got out of the city, the city rather, and survived, that lions would get you. Uh, we're not sure about that, but it certainly would seem that way. Chapter 16. And the lamb to the ruler of the land, from Selah all the way in the desert, to the mount of the daughters of Zion, like fleeing birds, like scattered nests, so are the daughters of Moab at the fords of Arnon. Now, it's interesting that Isaiah mentioned sheep here because this can mean one of two things. Um, sheep were used as tribute back then. It wasn't just gold and silver, but they also used livestock, like sheep, to pay tribute to a king. And you'll see that in 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 4 through 5. And it tells us that King Misha of Moab had paid tribute to the king of Jerusalem in sheep, but he had stopped when King Ahaz died, Ahab rather. And, and so what Isaiah may be saying here is that you should have continued your tribute because then you'd have an ally, which you no longer have. Or it could mean that a lamb was being offered or should be offered as a peace offering. I tend to lean more toward the fact that the lambs, the sheep were used as tribute. And so we see the daughters of Moab, the women of Moab, are leaving. They're scattered. They're becoming refugees. Look at verse 3. Give counsel. Grant justice. Make your shade like night in the height of noon. Shelter the outcast. Do not reveal the fugitive. Let the outcast of Moab rather, sojourn among you. Be a shelter to them from the destroyer. When the oppressor is no more, the destruction has ceased. And he who tramples underfoot has vanished from the land. Then the throne will be established in steadfast love. And on it will sit in faithfulness in the tent of David, one who judges and seeks justice and is swift to do righteousness. Now remember, Isaiah tends to go back and forth between near prophecies, prophecies that will happen within his lifetime, and far prophecies, prophecies that have not yet ent have not yet come about, would come about in the future. And it seems like he does it again right here. Because remember I told you, sometimes he goes back and forth within the same, within the same uh, subject that he's talking about, and he does it right here. Because what I just read refers to the tribulation, the Antichrist, and the Messiah to come. And what he's saying is, what God's saying to his prophet Isaiah, to Moab is, Give 
the people of Moab, the refugees, shelter in Judah. Shelter them because they're going to give you shelter when the time comes. And so when you look at Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 21, Jesus said there was going to come a time when if you were on the rooftop of your home, not to come down and go into your house and take anything, but to get out of the city. And woe to those nursing mothers who were nursing at that time, right? And he was talking about the tribulation. He's talking about when the Antichrist desecrates the temple, and then he turns his attention to the Jewish people and to the Christians who, who come, the tribulation saints who come to Christ in the, in the, uh, during the tribulation. And so Jesus is saying, you're not going to have any time. In, in Israel, in that day, and what he's referring to is every house was three-tiered. You have the roof, which they spent a lot of time on because it was cooler up there at, in the evening. And then the next level down was the sleeping quarters, and the level down from there is where they would keep their livestock, where they would store their goods. And so there was usually a ladder, or if you had a little bit more money, you had a set of steps built to the roof. And so... What he's saying is, if you come down those steps, if you come down that ladder, don't go back inside and gather your things. Get out of Dodge. And what we know is that they're going to flee to the mountains, to Jordan. And there is a city in Jordan called the Rock City of Petra. And you can look it up on the Internet. It's fascinating to look at. I was hoping on one of these trips to Israel that I'd get to see it, but it's kind of like a separate trip. It is impregnable. It's huge. It, they're all caves, and it's a literal city built in the side of a mountain. And it's not big enough to get a tank in. It's barely big enough to get a camel through. So you can't get in there. And Christians over the years have been storing Bibles in the caves, knowing that this prophecy one day would be fulfilled, that the Jewish people would flee to the rock city of Petra. They would find these Bibles that explain who Jesus is and explain what's going on, and they would be saved. Who knows if that's, that's going to happen or not, but you've got to give them an A for effort, right? So he's, God's telling them through his prophet that give them shelter because one day they are going to provide shelter for you. The destroyer, as I said, is the Antichrist. And then it talks about Isaiah talks about a throne established in steadfast love, a throne in the tent of David, the throne of David. That only refers to one person, the Messiah, as he sits on his throne in the millennial kingdom. So Isaiah now goes back to a near prediction. We have heard of the pride of Moab, and here's the problem. It's the pride of Moab. You're going to find out as we move into Ethiopia or Cush, it was the pride. Pride. Pride always comes before the fall, doesn't it? Proverbs 16, 18. How proud he is of his arrogance, his pride, and his insolence. In his idle boasting, he is not right. Therefore, let Moab wail for Moab. Let everyone wail. This, believe me, Moab has nothing to be proud about. They're a small, tiny little nation surrounded by huge nations. Where the pride comes from, I have no idea, but they're obviously proud that they are so small. Mourn utterly stricken for the raisin cakes of Ker Hesheth. Now, they're not mourning over raisin cakes in particular, unless they're the best raisin cakes in the world. They're mourning over the vineyards being destroyed. Because the raisin cakes are made from the grapes, right? So without the grapes, you can't have raisins. And that's what they're mourning over. They're mourning over the destruction of the vineyards. For the fields of Heshbon languish, and the vine of Shema, the lords of the nations, have struck down its branches, which has reached the Jazir, and strayed in the desert, and shoots spread abroad, and passed over the sea. Therefore I weep with the weeping of Jazir for the vine of Shema. I drench you with my tears, O Heshbon of Eliah, for over your summer fruit and your harvest the shout, the shout has ceased, and the joy and the gladness were taken away from the fruits of the field, and the vineyards, no songs are sung, no cheers are raised, no 
treader treads out the winepress. I have put an end to the shouting. Therefore, my inner parts moan like a, a lair for Moab, for my innermost self, for Kir Hesheth. And what he's mourning over, even Isaiah now is mourning over the loss of the vineyards, these beautiful, beautiful vineyards in Moab. And he's mourning over the loss of the harvest. You know, at harvest time is a time of joy. It's a time of celebration. But there won't be a harvest in Moab, so there won't be any joy. There won't be any celebrating. Isaiah, as I said, is just demonstrating the heart of God. God takes no pleasure in any of this. But this is judgment that's come upon Moab. When Moab presents himself, when he wearies himself of the high place, when he comes to his sanctuary to pray, he will not prevail. This is the word that the Lord spoke concerning Moab in the past. But now the Lord has spoken, saying, In three years, like the years of a hired worker, the glory of Moab will be brought into contempt in spite of all his great multitude, and those who remain will be very few and feeble. So God is saying that Moab, once a great nation, will be nothing more than a remnant. And you know, the more I look at our nation, and the more we turn away from the Lord, the more I wonder if there will come a time when we will just be a remnant. But notice where they turn to. They go to the high place again. They go to the sanctuary. They pray. They, they weary themselves praying, meaning they're there day and night just crying out to their gods so that their gods would help them to do anything to prevent what's going to happen from happening. They're seeking help, and they're seeking help in the wrong place, right? You know, in, in 2 Kings chapter 19, <clears throat> we read about King Hezekiah. And of all the kings we've read about in Isaiah so far, you know, they're all seeking help from outside sources. Judah went to Syria to help them against Assyria. And so you see kings making deals, making alliances with other nations to help them instead of going to God, who they should have gone to in the first place. And when you read about King Hezekiah, he's an interesting character because he receives a note from one of the Assyrian king's messengers. And the note basically says, you've seen what we did to the other lands around you. We're going to do the same thing to you. So Hezekiah doesn't now send for the kings of the nations bordering him, neighboring him for help. He takes that letter to God and basically says, Hey, Lord, these guys sent you a letter, right? I mean, it's, he's saying, Lord, I can't do anything about this. This is your problem. We're your people. I'm your servant. This is your problem. And you know how God handled it? Now, I've been saying this for three weeks now. In one night, 185,000 Assyrian troops were wiped out by one angel. That's how God handled it. We do the same thing. We make alliances. We go to people for help. We do everything except go to God and say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm your servant. I have this problem, but it's not my problem, Lord. I'm bringing it to you for you to take care of. Why don't we go to the Lord first? Why do we go to everyone else around us before we go to him first? And Hezekiah is a perfect example of what the king of Judah should have done. The king of Moab, all of them, should have gone to God first. Chapter 17, an oracle concerning Damascus, which, by the way, is modern-day Syria, which just happens to be in the news quite often, isn't it? Many believe that this refers to, or what, just to back up a minute, um, King Sargon of Assyria, um, in three years' time, when he talks about three years, Isaiah talks about three years, it's King Sargon of Assyria that comes against Moab and destroys it. But now Isaiah's focus shifts on Damascus, on Syria. And it says, Behold, Damascus will cease to be a city and will become a heap of ruins, the city of Aor are deserted, and for 
and will be for flocks which will lie down and none will make them afraid. In other words, there won't be anyone left, anybody around to make the sheep nervous. A fortress will disappear from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus and the remnant of Syria will be like the glory of the children of Israel, declares the Lord of hosts. Anyone here know when Damascus ceased to exist as a city? Anybody read about Damascus in the newspaper recently? Hear about Damascus on the news? It certainly hasn't ceased to be a city, has it? As a matter of fact, Damascus is the oldest city, the oldest inhabited city in the world. Some people believe it's the oldest city, period, in the world. I don't know about that, but I know it's the oldest inhabited city in the world. So Damascus has never ceased to be a city. It's never been in ruins. So this is another one of those prophecies where this is yet to take place. This is yet in the future. Matter of fact, we haven't even seen it yet. And this is one of those prophecies we look to. You know, when, I, when I'm doing, when I'm preparing for Convergence of Prophecy, I'm looking at Damascus. I'm looking at what's going on there because that is one of the prophecies we're looking at being fulfilled. And when we were looking at this, I pointed out that the Bashar nuclear plant that Israel keeps trying to take out that belongs to the Iranians, that's pretty close to Damascus. And a little collateral damage could easily wipe out that city when they take out that nuclear reactor. Maybe taking out that nuclear reactor is what wipes out Damascus. However, it's, it's a little too close for comfort. So we look because that, this prophecy could be fulfilled in our lifetime, could be fulfilled soon, as a matter of fact. Ephraim, or Israel, the northern kingdom, had aligned themselves with Syria. And Syria is going to be brought low, right along with Judah. And in the day, the glory of Jacob, Israel, will be brought low. For the fat of the flesh will grow lean, and it shall be when the reaper gathers standing grain as the arm harvests the ears. And as one who gleans the ears of grain in the valley of Rephraim, gleanings will be left in it, as when the olive tree is beaten two or three berries at the top of the highest bow, four or five of the branches of the fruit of the tree, declares the Lord God of Israel. It was actually a law in Deuteronomy that when the farmers farmed their fields, they had to leave gleanings on the edges of their fields so that the poor could come along behind them and take the gleanings. And some of the greedier farmers would actually put their arms around as they harvested, so they made sure nothing fell on the ground. And God's saying that the destruction is going to be so great that the only thing left is going to be the gleanings. That's all that will be left. There'll be not enough left for anybody to glean from. He's talking about complete and total destruction of Damascus. In that day, man will look at his maker, and his eyes will look to the Holy One of Israel. He will not look at the altars, the work of his hands, and he will not look at what his own fingers have made, either ashram or altars of incense. In that day, their strong cities will be like the deserted places of the wooded heights and the hilltops, and they Deserted be, they're deserted because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Isaiah talks about the work of the hands here. And we know from Scripture that man's hands, right, have created a temple. Man's hands have created idols. Circumcision is by, uh, the, is by the flesh. It's done by the hand. And, and the point is, it's all sinful man. But there will be a temple built without hands. There will be a circumcision without hands, a circumcision of the heart. And so what he's saying is, we depend on man. We depend on the flesh. We put our hope and trust in man and the flesh instead of in God. We should be putting our hope and trust in him. Then he says, for you have forgotten 
the God of your salvation. And that word forgotten literally means in the Hebrew to set aside. They've set aside the God of heaven for their own gods. You've not remembered the rock of your refuge. Therefore, though you plant pleasant plants and sow the vine branch of a stranger, though you make them grow on the day that you plant them and and make them blossom in the morning that you sow, yet the harvest will flee away. In the day of grief and incurable pain, ah, the thunder of many peoples and the thunder like the thundering of the sea, the roar of nations, they roar like the roaring of the mighty waters, The nations roar in the roaring of many waters. He will rebuke them, and they will flee far away, chased like chaff of the mountains before the wind and whirling dust before the storm. At evening time, behold, terror. Before morning, they are no more. This is the portion of those who loot us and the the lot of those who plunder us. And so what Isaiah sees now is a rush of nations against, against Israel and against Syria But then God helps Israel and Syria and causes those, that invading army, to flee. And they'll flee like he describes here, like the dust before the storm, like a tumbleweed blows in the wind. Or like the chaff that blows away when you toss up the grain in the air. God will cause them to flee. Look at chapter 18. Ah, land of whirling wings. Now he's talking about destruction that will come upon Cush, which is, by the way, modern-day Ethiopia. And at the time Isaiah gives this prophet, prophecy, Ethiopia has control over, many scholars believe it was the lower Egypt. So they're ruling over part of Egypt at this point. Ethiopia at one time was a much larger nation than it is today. And he says, ah, the land of whirling wings, meaning there's many insects or locusts come from here. That is beyond the rivers of Cush, which sends ambassadors by the sea in vessels of papyrus on the waters. Go, you swift messengers, to a nation tall and smooth. And so he's talking about leaving Cush to Judah to form an alliance with Judah against the Assyrians. Okay, so here's another alliance being built. To a nation tall and smooth, referring to the Nubians. To a people feared far and near, a nation mighty and conquering, whose land the rivers divide. And we're talking about the Nile River and all its tributaries. All you inhabitants of the world, you who dwell on the earth, when the signal is raised on the mountains, on the mountains, look when a trumpet is blown. Hear, for thus the Lord said to me, I will quietly look from my dwelling like clear heat and sunshine like a cloud of dew in the heat of the harvest. For before the harvest, when the blossom is over and the flower becomes a ripening grape, he cuts off the shoots with the pruning hooks and the spreading branches of the he lops off and clears away. They shall all of them be left to the birds of prey on the mountains and to the beasts of the earth and the birds of prey will summer on them and all the beasts of the earth will winter on them at the time Well, we'll stop there for a minute. So God is... God is saying that he's capable of protecting Judah. They don't need to align with Cush. They don't need to align with Ethiopia against the Assyrians. He's more than capable capable of taking care of them because an alliance with them will rot like the harvest rots. It's not going to bear any fruit, he's saying. God's going to prune Assyria just to prove, pr- prove a point. They're going to be so completely destroyed that they'll become food for the birds of the air, for the b- birds of prey. And that's, if that sounds familiar to you, you see that in Revelation 19 with the Battle of Armageddon and all the armies are laying there in the fields and they become prey for the birds of the air. At that time, tribute will be brought to the Lord of hosts from a people tall and smooth, from a people feared near and far, a nation mighty and conquering, whose land and rivers divide. To Mount Zion, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts. So Cush is one day 
Ethiopia is one day going to come to worship God. And we know that that will, well, they say, a lot of scholars believe it was partially fulfilled in Acts chapter 8. Remember when, the, when Philip comes upon the Ethiopian eunuch and the Ethiopian eunuch is saved and so then he gets baptized and so they're saying that this is partially fulfilled there. I don't know about that. It's just a great story to remind you of. However, this will be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom when all the nations come before the Lord, when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What time we got? 7.15. So I was going to go through chapter 20, but we'll stop there because we're kind of short on time. And uh, we will end the live feed now for Isaiah and pick it up.